Welcome back. So we've already looked at the text grammatically and now we uh, shift gears and we approach the text from a literary perspective. Now uh, we start off with an important but uh, simple question and that is what kind of literature does our text belong to because if we weren't looking at letters, if we were looking at poetry, if we were looking at apocalyptic, if we were looking at parables, well then that would impact uh, how we would engage in a literary analysis of the text. But we're looking at letters as we indeed are throughout this course and that's why our background reading and discussion on how to read a letter as a letter and Paul the letter writer will hopefully bear fruit with us now as we look at this passages and others in uh, our course to come. Now the first thing we have to do is we have to make sure we begin at the right place. It's ever so important that uh, we begin at the right place and we end at the right place. If you begin in the middle of a discussion or end in the middle of the discussion, all kinds of bad things can potentially happen. And uh, maybe this isn't a big concern for you because you're saying, I know where it begins. It begins wherever the new paragraph begins or where there's a heading in my Bible. But that's where we have to remember that all of these paragraph breaks, like the verse breaks and also the headings, these are all artificial distinctions made in contemporary times. The original manuscripts had, remember, scriptio continua. They just keep on going. But that doesn't mean that the biblical writers didn't leave clues, important clues, as to where to begin and where to end. They just left different kind of clues than we're used to. They left primarily literary clues. And so we're going to look at those, but because we're looking at a letter, instead of the more broad literary clues, of which we'll also look, we're also looking at more narrowly epistolary or letter structure clues. So where does the passage start? Well, pretty clearly at verse 13. And we know that because we see, for instance, evocative. And we now know that evocative is a common transitional device used by Paul and other letter writers of that day. Secondly, we see the disclosure formula. Although, again, if you look at it in English, it may not be so as obvious as in Greek. One of the advantages of learning Greek is not so much for the grammatical principle, although that's advantageous too, but you can see more easily and obviously a lot of epistolary and literary clues in the original language. Because the original Greek says, we do not want you not to know. And as soon as you would see the verb to know, hopefully the bells are ringing, ding, 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 and you say, maybe in robotic-like fashion, but you'd be accurate and it would be good, you would say disclosure formula, another transitional device. The third formula is here, and not so easy to see, that's the peri de formula. Normally peri de are the first two words of a sentence. The de has to be the second word because it's a particle always in the, we call it the post positive position, the secondary position in a sentence. But the peri, the preposition, has been pushed back here, unlike earlier in 4.9 and later in 5.1. Here the peri has been pushed back in the sentence because Paul has inserted the disclosure formula. But we have three epistolary clues that clearly mark the start of this passage. Now, we look not only at literary and more narrowly epistolary clues, we also look at uh, shifts in subject matter. There's a saying of mine that I gave students in the Gateway course that uh, I think is helpful here, and that is, form supplements, but does not supplant content. I'll say that again, form supplements, but does not supplant content. So this quote is making the distinction between form and content, between uh, what the text says, that's content, and the form in which that content comes to us. Right? One deals with what the text says, the other one deals with how the text says it. And what I mean in this saying, form supplements but does not supplant content, is we begin first with the form of the text. Why do we begin with that rather than the content? Because the form is usually more objective than the content. But that doesn't mean that the content is unimportant. It also is part of this discerning process. And so what we notice in terms of content is Paul shifts in subject matter at verse 13. 
If you look at the earlier verses, you th see things about brotherly and sisterly love and the need for self-sufficient work and not to take advantage of the love of brothers and sisters. And before that, you see another passage about holiness and sexual conduct. But you see nothing in the preceding verses about Christians who have died, and especially Christians who have died relating to the second coming of Jesus. And so when you look at verse 13 following, you can see there's a fairly dramatic shift in content. But as important as that clue is, it can sometimes be misleading because Paul's rhetorical persuasive strategy sometimes seemingly leaves a subject behind, but he hasn't. He's going to come back to it just a little farther down the road. And that's why if you base your argument only on content, it's a bit too subjective and potentially misleading. And so that's why it's nice to have a balance of form, formal features, supplementing, not supplanting, but working together with uh, the content, as we have here. So we've got evidence formally, epistolarily, that Paul's beginning in verse 13, and that's supported by the shift in content also. And so that's a good illustration of that saying. Well, we also have to know where the passage ends. And actually, this is a good illustration of how if you based your argument only on content rather than also form or giving preference to form, you might make a mistake. Because if you look at the passage that comes after 4, 13 to 18, that's then chapter 5, 1 to 11. If you looked at chapter 5, 1 to 11, you would see that it deals with, well, the second coming. And you might say, and indeed a lot of commentators do, oh, 4, 13 to 18 deals with the second coming. 5, 1 to 11 deals with the second coming. It's all the same thing. Therefore, we should treat 4, 13 all the way to 5, 11 as one legitimate and unified unit. But there are some important literary and more narrowly epistolary clues found here marking the end of the passage of verse 18 and the beginning of a new one at 5.1. For example, we see the Greek uh, word hasta. It means so then or therefore. And uh, just like parishioners today get excited when the, per when the pastor says therefore or so then, because then they know that the that the argument is almost, or the sermon's almost going to come to an end. Similarly, when Paul says hosta, he is signaling the end of his discussion that he's wrapping things up. And not only does the word hosta alone, in terms of its meaning, suggest that he's bringing the discussion to a close, but it actually functions that way elsewhere in Paul's writings. You can see here there I have a number of references to 1 Corinthians. Because in the second half of the letter, where Paul deals with all the peri death sections, the different topics, he quite often marks the ending of his long discussion of those topics with the word hosta. So I have a strong clue already that verse 18 is beginning to wrap up, if not actually wraps up the discussion with the word hosta. And then it's confirmed because the next verse, 5 verse 1, begins with evocative, another transitional device, starting something new. And then you also see there the peri de formula, this time right at the beginning of the sentence, more obviously seen, now about the times and the seasons. And then you get to verse 2 and you get a disclosure formula, you know, in fact you know it accurately. And so you've got three epistolary clues, along with the meaning of the word hosta, which show that the passage, our passage, comes to a close in verse 18. Also, this is not so obvious, but it's worth noting, there's a bit of an inclusio. Inclusio, right? Now that's not an epistolary device, but it is a literary device. That's when a speaker repeats something at the beginning and the end, and this repetition of a key word or phrase acts like bookends, marking the boundaries of this particular unit. So the psalmist has this all the time. He'll begin with praise the Lord and he'll end with praise the Lord, marking the boundaries of a particular psalm. Well, normally we talk about inclusios in terms of repetition of a same word or phrase or even a whole clause or sentence. We don't have that here, but what we do have is what I might call a thematic inclusio. Because verse 13 began with a problem, a problem of grieving, and verse 18 deals with something called comfort. And comfort answers the problem, it gives the solution to the problem of grieving, and once you give a solution to a problem, well, that's typically where a discussion might come to an end. And so the thematic inclusio also, I think, verifies or confirms the boundaries and that you end at uh, 4.18. There's still another literary kind of device. It's a little more technical and detailed, but 
We have time, and why not use this as another way to illustrate a literary approach to the text? And that is, I noticed how how chapter 4, 13 to 18 is set apart from both the passage before it and the passage after it in terms of it being, that is uh, chapter 4, 13 to 18, being new material. Uh, a matter that Paul apparently never talked about or discussed with the Thessalonians. And that's different than the stuff beforehand and the stuff afterwards. Beforehand, we could call that previously shared topics. Paul, in a certain sense, has, says to them, been there and done that. You can see in 4.1, he says, we instructed, past tense. When did Paul instruct them how they should walk in a way that pleases God? Oh, it must have happened when he was there for three plus weeks when he first came to the city and started the church. Or 4.2, what instructions we gave you. Well, when did Paul give them these instructions? Again, Paul is drawing their attention to the back uh, period when he was there for three plus Sabbaths starting the church. Then in 4.6b, in the middle of a discussion about holiness and sexual conduct, he says, as we have already told you. right? So we've already gone over this business about how you should be holy with regard to your sexual conduct. And then in the last reference, 11b, that's in the middle of 4, 9 to 12, about brotherly and sisterly love and how you ought to be self-sufficient by working to provide for your own basic needs. Paul again says, just as we told you. So four times in the earlier material, Paul makes it clear that been there and done that. We've already talked about this before. But then when we come to 4.13, and Paul says, we do not want you not to know... Well, that's different, right? We never talk to you about what happens to Christians who die before Jesus comes again. And so the next passage or verses, 4, 13 to 18, is a little set apart from that which is beforehand. And the same thing is true from the passage that comes afterwards, because when we look at 5.1, and we've already seen how that starts a new topic. Yes, it's still about the end times, but it's a different topic of the end times. Paul says in 4.1b, we do not need to write to you. Right? Why, don't you. why doesn't Paul need to write to you about the times and the seasons? Well, because you already know that. We must have already told that to you when we were with you beforehand. And verse 2 is even more clear. You know it, and you not only know it, know it but you know it very well. And so you can see that 4.13 to 18, the boundaries are set apart, our passage from the text both before it and after it. All right, now... I grant you that everything we've said so far under literary uh, typically won't make it to the pulpit or to the classroom, right? But that's sometimes the way it is with exegesis. There are important things that we need to do to understand the then and there of the text, but when we move to the here and now for today, it's either too technical or it's not, uh, so to say, relevant for our audience. But it, it, again, is important. So, so far, we're not quite done literary, though, because what have we done? We've marked the boundaries. I know that it begins at, at 4.13, my text, and I know that it ends at 4.18. And so if I could draw it on a board, I've kind of got a blob of text. I don't have that many verses, but from verse 13 to 18, I have all these texts. And now I know this is my, what well, I'll call it, my legitimate preaching unit, or my legitimate literary unit, or my legitimate pericope on which I'm going to teach or speak. Right? I know where it begins, I know where it ends, and so let's go. Except, well, this is what often happens. right? In such a case, a person might say, okay, the first verse is verse 13, and so they start, verse 13, and they go, da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da. They explain to their audience what verse 13 means. Then they go to the next verse, verse 14, they go, da-da-da-da-da-da-da, and they explain what, what verse 14 means. And then they go on to the next verse, verse 15, da 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 In other words, they're going through verse by verse through the text. Now we have a name for this. Uh, in preaching, anyway, we call it expository preaching. Expository preaching, in which the preacher or the teacher goes through and exposits, explains in a verse by verse fashion, the biblical text. Now this is a good thing, but it's not a great thing. Okay. It is a good thing, but it's not a great thing. Let me explain. First of all, it's a good thing to do because, well, at least you're expositing on, you're explaining the biblical text. In other words, unlike many preachers or teachers who first read the Bible, right, and then they spend the rest of their class or the rest of their sermon fleeing the Bible, Right? by telling not what the text says, but telling instead interesting stories, maybe some application, and they might be tempted to do that because it's a lot easier to tell interesting stories and to give application than it is to kind of 
roll up your sleeves and exegete the text, to approach the text from a grammatical, literary, historical, and theological perspective. So instead of doing that, you are going through verse by verse. And that's then a good thing compared to the alternative that I just said. But I call that approach uh, often army exegesis, because you are marching like an army, verse by verse, through the text. And again, it's a good thing, but it's not a great thing. Why? Well, because Paul didn't just start in verse 13 and then didn't have a clue where he's going. Instead, he had an idea where to go from point A to point B. I'm using the analogy here of MapQuest. Let's imagine you're heading out for an evening to a place you don't know where it is, and, and well, if you're smart, you'll map quest it, right? You want to get from point A to point B in the most deliberate and efficient way possible. And Paul, when he begins a passage, it's not like he has no idea what he's going to say and he just kind of meanders around and kind of talks and talks and talks with no direction or purpose and then finally runs out of things to say and brings it to a close. No, he is a skilled letter writer who has thought carefully not just about what he's going to say, but how he's going to say it. And that's a literary question. So it's very important, once you've identified the boundaries of a passage, to also ask the question, what is its internal structure? You're trying to get into the mind of Paul. What was he thinking or trying to accomplish by treating the text this way and with these kind of arguments and in this order rather than in some other way? And that's a great initial step toward exegesis. By the way, um, this, well, maybe I'll, I'll hold off. I'll just go on to the next and I'll say that a little later on instead. So when we do that, when we look at the text, and we, I'm trying to recreate how my mind worked, it might be a scary thought, but how this process might go as you try to understand the internal structure of a passage. It's going to help, and especially for this passage, you have, if you have the Greek text in front of you. Now, I, I noticed already, and I kind of said already in this presentation, that, that the beginning of the passage starts with a problem namely uh, the church is grieving, and it ends with a solution, namely they're comforted. So I already kind of have a sense about how 13 is a kind of an introductory verse, giving the problem, and verse 18 is a concluding verse, and I know it's concluding also because of that hosta, that marker, and also the closing, that kind of thematic inclusio, closing command to comfort, the opposite the solution to grief. So now I'm thinking, well, how does 14 through 17, those remaining verses in between, fit? And then when you look at the Greek text, you see in verse 14 a little Greek word. In Greek, it's gar, G-A-R. And instead of saying, you know, it's only a little word, how important it can that be? And in fact, some of the translations, you know, they just omit it altogether. It's not even found there in the translation. No, 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 no. These little particles, these little words are very, very helpful in revealing what Paul was thinking and how he intends this statement, this sentence, to be understood in light of the surrounding ones. So the little particle gar often introduces an explanation or gives a cause or a reason for something that has just been said. And so when I see the gar that opens verse 14, I'm thinking, okay, Paul said something in verse 13, and now Gar, verse 14, he's going to give a reason why he said it. He's going to give some causal statement. Why did he say what he did in verse 13? Because of whatever it says in verse 14. And then I'm trying to avoid, just for the moment, the actual content of the verses. I'm just trying to kind of get a big picture view of the text, not get lost in the details and try to understand its macro structure. Then I notice the next verse also begins with a guard. I go, oh, well, I guess if verse 14 introduces one cause or reason for what Paul said in verse 13, I guess verse 15 must give a second cause or reason for what he said in verse 13. And then I go to verse 16, and I say, well, maybe there'll be another guard. There'll be a third cause, a nice three-point sermon or something like that. And and that's where, especially in Greek, you can see, no, 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 it's got gar in 14, it's got gar in verse 15 that opens, but then verse 16 instead opens with hati. So I guess Paul didn't want these to be three equal parallel grounds. And so I guess that 1617 statement, that kind of long section there, must fit differently than the two gar clauses of verse 14 and 15. So then I open my eyes up a little more and I try to look at the content of these verses. What do these verses say and does that reinforce some of my initial inclinations about what's going on? And, and again, I'll try to give you a window about how this might work. So I looked at verse 13 and uh, it still had a problem when I looked at it, but I thought, well, maybe that's too negative. Instead of 
talking about what the problem is, they're grieving, maybe I can instead start with an assertion more positively. Because Paul does say in verse 13, right, we do not want you not to know about those who have fallen asleep or to grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. So if you look at that verse more carefully, you can see that Paul is actually asserting something in verse 13. He's saying, yes, okay, you've got a problem, you're grieving. But he's saying, wait a minute, we Christians don't grieve like the rest of people namely non-Christians. We Christians grieve differently than them. We Christians grieve with hope. And so I saw Paul as kind of asserting this positive truth at the beginning of the passage. He's saying to the Thessalonian Christians, right, we don't grieve like the rest of men who have no hope. We're different. We grieve with hope. And then what gives him the reason to say that? I mean, that's a pretty powerful claim, Paul, right? What, what, what is this hope that you're talking about? How can I, even in the midst of death, the death of a loved one, how can I have hope? And Paul says, well, gar, right? Reason number one is, well, Jesus has done something. Remember, this is that conditional clause. If, or maybe since, Right? If we believe, and we do indeed believe, that Jesus died and rose again, then God will bring with Jesus those who have fallen asleep in him. We'll talk further later on about the, 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 the kind of theological missing link that Paul makes between the first half of the verse and the second half of the verse. But for now we'll say, Paul appeals in verse 14 to what Jesus has done, namely his resurrection, as a guarantee of believers' resurrection. Right? So you guys are grieving about your deceased loved ones. Don't worry about them because Jesus rose and that means therefore your dead loved ones will also rise. And if they rise, well then they will be with Jesus when he comes. They will be alive and participate fully in the glory and splendor of Jesus' return. That's, my, that's Paul's first argument. And remember, we also said that verse 14 might be a place where Paul is not just giving his own words, but he might be quoting from a confession of the church in order to add more weight to his words. So it's not just you and I, you Thessalonians and me, Paul, believe that Jesus died and rose again, but, but the whole church believes that Jesus died and rose again. The whole church believes that our dead loved ones will rise just as Jesus rose, and therefore our deceased loved ones will be raised, they'll be resurrected, they'll be alive, they'll participate fully in the glory of Jesus' return. So that sounds like that would fit my initial idea that the first clause is giving a, a reason why uh, Paul asserted in the opening verse that Christians grieve without hope. Let's go on to the next Gar Clause. Well, that looks like it deals with not what Jesus has done, but what Jesus has said. Because we read in there, verse 15, about a word of the Lord. And then we remember that for Paul, the Lord isn't God, it isn't the Holy Spirit, it's the Lord Jesus, or the Lord Jesus Christ. And so Paul has some word from Jesus Christ and right now we're not going to worry about where he got this word or what in these verses is that word. Right now we're going to observe that Paul doesn't just give his opinion. He doesn't just guess. No, he says, I have a word of the Lord, an authoritative word of the Lord. And because it's from Jesus, it's reliable, it's weighty, it's trustworthy. And what is this word of the Lord? Well, Paul says, we who are alive when Jesus comes again, we will Ooh, may, emphatic future negation. We will certainly not, we will absolutely not, we will by no means be ahead of those who have already fallen asleep. Now verses 16 and 17 are a little more tricky, but I thought about them longer than you have, and it became clear to me for a variety of reasons, and you can see that reflected in the commentary that they explain then further the word of the Lord, right? They not only contain the word of the Lord, but they also offer Paul's summary of that word of the Lord. So Paul has the opening assertion. He gives one reason in verse 14, the weighty word of the church. He gives another reason in verse 15, the weighty word of Jesus, of the Lord, with some explana ex ex explanation comments afterwards. And then you get verse 18, the hosta, the so then, the therefore, where he brings it to a close. And so if you mapped it out a little more refinely, Right Here would then be my exegetical outline. Not necessarily my preaching outline, I'll say something about that in a second, but my exegetical outline. In other words, this is my understanding of Paul's internal structure. And I didn't just 
impose it on the text. I didn't just say any meeny miny mo looks like a main point over here, one over there. I tried to let the text speak as much as possible to tell me where the main points are and how many of them are and what order and so forth. So you can see again the more refined exegetical outline involves first then an assertion. Paul in verse 13 basically says, you know, Christians grieve, yes, and they grieve for deceased believers, yes, but they grieve for deceased believers with hope. Why? Reason number one. Well, a weighty word of the church. Because Christ's resurrection guarantees the resurrection of our dead Christian brothers and sisters. And if they're going to rise, guaranteed by Jesus' resurrection, then they will be alive, they won't miss out, they will participate fully in Jesus' glorious return. And then there's a second reason, introduced in verse 15. The first one was a weighty word of the church, right? It was a word of the church, not just Paul, and it was weighty because it included the voice of the whole church of the, uh, of the early, uh, early Christians. And the second one involves not only the word of the Lord, but it's weighty too because it's not just Paul's feeling or intuition. No, it comes from the authoritative word or voice of Jesus. And again, it's that emphatic future negation, right, that we living Christians will absolutely not be ahead of dead Christians. Or to say it differently, dead Christians will not be behind or at a disadvantage over living Christians. And so that leads then to the conclusion, the hosta, therefore comfort one another with these words. Well, we've almost wrapped up our literary analysis, but allow me to say something about um, how this exegetical outline relates to and is similar to, but perhaps different from my sermon outline. So the exegetical outline, right, reflects the structure of the text. And I personally like to have the exegetical outline become the sermon outline for my sermon. It seems kind of silly to do all this hard work to discern the internal structure of a passage and then throw it all away and sit down behind your computer and say, now I need some structure, I need some outline for my sermon. Right? Why not have the outline of the text tell you and be a big part of determining what the outline for the sermon is? Because, you know, if you preach a sermon outline from the text, the good news is it will always drive you back to the text. I'll say that again. If your sermon outline comes from the text, it isn't one you've artificially imposed. You haven't said, all good sermons have three points, so I'm going to put one here, maybe there, and here's another good point, oh yeah. But if you let the text reveal to you, right, its internal structure, and you use that structure in your own sermon, and you follow that out in your preaching, it'll always take you and your hearers back to the text. And that's a good thing. You can never go wrong with explaining the text. That's the ground, that's the authority on which you preach and you teach. And that way when people come to you and say, you know, I don't like what you said, or I'm a kind of annoyed pastor because of this, or you claim that, and I'm as, you say, well, hey, sorry, you know, it's not me, it's not my opinion, it's not just my feeling. This is the text. Now, of course, there are other ways to uh, talk about the form of a sermon, and I'm open to them too. One common one we do here at Calvin Theological Seminary is the four page method, and there are some advantages to that structure. I especially like, um, like it not so much as the form for my structure, but as a kind of a theological corrective. I'm in Paul a lot, at least that's my excuse for maybe this sin, and, the, and, and Paul you know, often leads to a kind of an exhortation of his audience, and I have to watch that I don't uh, just kind of exhort people to live a certain way and to do certain things and thereby downplay the element of grace and how when we live a holy life it's not in order to secure God's favor but it's actually in response to God's favor. And so, um, you know, the, one of the pages, I think you're familiar with the four-page method, you know, is grace in the text and then grace in the world. So the four-page method forces me to think whether I've done enough justice to that principle in my sermon. And I'm not against having the whole sermon actually form follow the four-page method either. But my preference is, as I've already indicated, to have the outline of the sermon reflect very closely the exegetical outline of the text. Indeed, when you and I get together, hopefully in person, and I have a chance to preach to you, then you should be able to hear in my sermon outline, you should be able to hear and then visually see the exegetical outline from which that sermon outline came from.
Well, we've now covered the second of our four or five hermeneutical principles, the literary, and so we take a break, and when we come back again, we turn to a historical analysis of the text.